Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Harold Thornbro, joined today by Rachel Jameson. Rachel's joining us as usual. Um, how do you like being a host on this show, Rachel? I really enjoy it. It's fun conversation time, isn't it? We have trouble stopping sometimes, though. <laughs> today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about seed saving, seed storing, seed saving, all that kind of stuff. Why and the how and all that good stuff. Um, before we jump into that, though, what you been doing on your homestead? I have been making bread and roasting tomatoes and working online, <laughs> and um, I have peppers finally. Peppers finally. Peppers, you finally, finally got some peppers. Yeah, wow. Out Check it out. And I've got peppers coming. Yay. You, you built a website, too. You want to tell people about that? I did. Um, uh, you got boy, your blogger now. Into the deep end here. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Rewilder Life. And um, if you go there, you'll see why and the definition as to why I chose that name. Rewilderlife.com. Yeah. Yeah. And I get you there. This, you know, um, RL is my initials. So my first and middle. And then um, I was inspired by Laura Ingalls Wilder. So, Yeah. Looks good. It's going to be a great. Rewilding myself from a city girl <laughs> to a country girl. It's going to be a great blog. You've only got a couple posts on there right now, but you just started it. So we look forward to many, many, many great posts there. But uh, And lots of little tips and tricks. And you already got your ketchup recipe. We mentioned a few episodes ago about your ketchup recipe. And you put that up as one of your first posts. So. Yeah, Good I want to get it out there before ketchup season was. That's right. Yeah, you so know, people can go all, check that out. Buy your seeds for your ketchup. You know how you have your little gardens, and they say, "I'll oh, make your your uh, salsa garden and mm -hmm. your tea garden." Well, you can now make your ketchup garden. Well, I will. I will put a link to that article that you wrote with the ketchup Thank recipe you. in the show notes, so everybody can go check that out. Thanks. And you, you said you've been roasting tomatoes. Is that what you said? Roasting tomatoes? Yeah, I roasted tomatoes. You, yeah. What do you do after you roast them? You just can't you can them after that, or do you? I'm going to make more ketchup. You're just making more ketchup. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And then I'll can the ketchup. <laughs> You'll can the ketchup. That there's your plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the family liked has liked the recipe so much that I can't keep it. Well, I've actually been doing some seed saving and some seed buying. I bought some cover crop seeds this week and got out there and got a couple beds done. And I got a few more. I wanted to uh I wanted to solarize them at first. So I put some plastic over a couple of beds that I wanted to kill because they got pretty weedy. And I wanted to, and, I, and some of the weeds went to seed because I wasn't pulling weeds enough because, you know, lazy gardener stuff. And uh, yeah, so I thought I better cover these up for about two or weeks or so and let them really get cooked real good. And then, then put my uh, cover crop seeds in. So uh, some of them I did that with. Uh, so I haven't put all those in the ground yet, but I need to pretty soon. And uh, is your mic falling? That's weird. No, I'm pushing. Oh, it a bit. <laughs> I thought I just need it going down. And I was All like, those people falling. watching the video get to, get to see what I was doing. That yeah, was... I'm pushing my mic down. <laughs> I just seen the mic dropping. I just realized it looks absolutely huge in the video. <laughs> that was funny. Um, yeah, I did that. And uh, so we got to, I got, I bought, uh, now you did rye and uh, peas in your we cover did. crops. We're, and now, but. Now that it's later up here, we're doing, we're going to sow some rye and wheat this weekend Okay. because it will die off and then grow back again. Yeah. I'm going with hairy, hairy vetch. I've used it in the past. I really like it. It grows really good and it grows right up. It, it, when it starts getting really cool out, it still grows. It's a pretty cool weather plant. So it'll grow right up into the pretty cold weather and then nice. before it dies back. So it, you know, as I'm planting a little bit later, um, it should be a you know pretty good size before I chop it down. So, um, that's why I went with that, but I went with that before and I just like the way it grows. It's real thick and yeah, I'd like to grows get nice. That. We have some naturally at our crop. Yeah. It's one of the things that is an invasive plant, but when planted as a cover crop and, you know, growing yeah, it into the winter and cut it down, it's fine. Yeah. It's one of those things you don't want to go to seed, unlike with our seed saving. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, uh, gotta be careful. It, any cover crop could mess your life up if you planted it too early and it went to seed so yeah don't ever plant a cover crop in the spring unless you're going to really pay attention to it <laughs> because yeah it'll put some seeds down that you won't catch if you let it go other than that i'm trying to think what else i did that's about that was the, the i did collect a bunch of seeds this week i got cucumbers and tomatoes some tomatoes and always lettuce i'm always grabbing lettuce seed and uh oh i got beet seeds which I don't usually grab, but I got some beet seeds this year and I collected those and some turnips 
So yeah, I got a lot of those. I, I saw your post on the front porch. The cucumber, cucumber seeds. Cucumbers. Yeah. Those big old yellow giant cucumbers. I was after cleaning. That's one of the beds I tore out because I had those, you know, I was like, oh, and they were hidden down under a bunch of stuff. I was like, oh, look at this, where all these leaves were fell on top of them and had them big giant yellow cucumbers. And it's like Perfect. not not a bad thing when you want to collect seeds. Yeah. Right. Lazy what, gardening is not always a yeah, you take advantage of those things, and other people are saying, "Yeah, I just throw them in my chickens and they chicken feed or whatever." You know, another person told me that they, that's when they make um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the cubed pickles or whatever. They'll take those big ones and cube them, and make some kind of a pickle, like cubed pickles or something. I don't know. He was giving. He showed me a. He put a link on my uh, Facebook page, not the group, uh, to that, or uh, told me about that on the Facebook. And I was like, "Well, that's interesting. Never." Interesting. Heard of that. That's pretty cool. But yep, yeah, that was uh, my week on the homestead. And uh, sounds productive. Eh, <laughs> yard work. I did a lot of that too. It seemed like it caught up with me. Um, but anyway, why and how to save and store seeds from your garden? Do you do a lot of seed saving? I have started to do more. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I do a lot. Well, we talked about last week. You yeah. got plans to save seeds. Like you did potato seeds this year. You collected potato seeds, right? Right. Yes, I did. And I've never I, done that. I've done some, I've saved seeds from corn, tomatoes. Yeah. Um, corn is supposed to be hard, but for me, it's easy. Because yeah, I, I don't think it's yeah. so hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, mostly because people worry about cross-pollination. Yeah, I guess it could be, depending how you, yeah. Because I uh, pollinate quite a ways away, but I don't. I actually pollinate my, because I plant corn in small plots, I actually pollinate it myself i shake the tassels and i put on some paper and yeah. i go around and blow it on the or i take the top you know and then blow it on the tassels and um i actually go around the entire garden doing that right when it first starts putting out the tassels so i can do that so it doesn't get cross-pollinated with something else oh, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, well, we can talk about that when we get yeah yeah we'll get down to that here in a few minutes um, but so you definitely collect yeah, some so seeds. i have some i mean i just wouldn't say i'm like i haven't done lots of it and i've kind of avoided the more difficult ones mm -hmm. as i'm what ones do you consider more difficult some people would put tomatoes in that category actually See, i think tomatoes are easy but yeah. um what do i consider more difficult mostly the ones that you have to let like, grow for two years yes Parsley yes or, yeah your yeah. biennials are definitely more difficult um yeah so i have not done a lot of those and i haven't saved carrot seeds or carrots lettuce. i haven't yeah. done lettuce seeds um lettuce is super easy yeah yeah i have lettuce right now that has gone to seed mm -hmm. but i need to check because i believe that's not i believe it's a hybrid so okay yeah we can talk about that here in a few minutes too about the differences and where you want to collect seeds and where you wouldn't so there there are some really good reasons to save seeds um mm -hmm. i think self-sufficiency is number one i mean to be able right. to have those seeds produced on your property to be able to reproduce what you've grown this year next year with seeds that you've collected um it's it's a level of self-sufficiency i mean because who knows i mean i'm not a doom and gloomer we've said many times right. on the show neither one of us are but maybe you can't get those seeds next year for some reason you know well, or maybe there's just a yeah. shortage you know yeah Sometimes it's hard to even find, like you have a favorite, but it's everybody else's favorite. Yeah. Or, it sells um, out quick. Yeah. Yeah. And last year, I mean, the last couple of years have kind of been an example as to why it might be beneficial to save seeds just because sometimes it's been hard to find what we want. Yeah. Yeah. And it can get a little expensive too, buying seeds. Um, I've spent a few hundred dollars before on seeds in the past, <laughs> you know, a trying few. to. Just a few? Oh, yeah. Terrible. Yeah, I said I spent a lot of money on seeds, and uh, yeah, so I try to save a lot of seeds because it saves me a lot of money. If I I plant lettuce, I mean I'm planting lettuce like every other week. If I bought all those seeds, <laughs> that's a lot of money all year long, you know, because um, right. I plant a couple rows, you know. Um, so you save a lot of money saving your own seeds. So on top of self sufficiency, you save money and preparedness. I mean, just having the means to do it, you know, knowing how to do it. Um, there's a level of preparedness there in case you ever did have to collect seeds and couldn't buy them which as, but really that falls under self-sufficiency, I guess, um, preserving genetic diversity. Now we don't have to worry about that usually as far as buying seeds, because most places are practicing methods that are really good about right. that. Um, so it's not a big issue, but if you're, if there was a time where you just didn't know what you were getting, you know, it, it could be anything or, 
you know, when you're what we were you just said a few minutes ago about hybrid plants, hybrids are a combination of plants. They're not GMO. It's not GMO. There's nothing wrong with hybrids. It's a natural thing that occurs. But when you say the seeds from a hybrid plant, you will not get a true to type plant from what you save the seeds from. Right. So you kind of preserve genetic diversity when you save seeds from heirloom plants, from heirloom vegetables. Um, so you can kind of continue that on. I like the idea of, of passing on those skills to future generations. I gardened my whole life, grew up gardening, but we never save seeds. Right. I didn't have a clue how to save seeds. Honestly, when I started homesteading, didn't know nothing about it. So what I like about it too, though, is, um, I, is when you save a seed from a specific climate and it thrives in that climate, you're saving that those genetics that are specific. Like if I grew, I can buy Mm -hmm. seeds from a gardener that is in your area and they'll still work in my area, but they become more, the longer I save them from my own garden and my own climate, they do better in that. And yeah, they'll adapt that, to that area yeah, it resi- for sure. It's that resilience in the seeds mm-hmm. genetics, I think. And yeah. then on top of it, like you were saying, I just love the idea. I know people that um I have a couple of friends who have seeds from like, oh, my grandpa saved this seed and his grandpa before him and his grandpa before him. And this is the corn seed that my family has always yep. saved. I think that is so cool. <laughs> There's a lot of that out there. That and it's something so cool, cool to pass down. And I think it's cool. I actually got some lettuce seeds from my grandpa oh, <laughs> before he died as cool. I we, I was just there talking to him about gardening one day and he's like we well, you know how to collect and this was back when I very first started gardening again you know as far as an adult and he's like you know how to save seeds out of that lettuce because I was talking about this lettuce I had that I really like he was well you need to save seeds out of that you know how to save seeds from that I'm like never done it I just buy them he's like well it's easy and he's telling me how to do it and he's a like, matter of fact I got some and he went back there and started digging out some that lettuce seeds so cool. and yeah so I've kept that like going family china you know yeah like yeah family seeds and it doesn't seem like a big deal, uh, but I've heard of a lot of other homesteaders, you know, same thing. I've heard that uh, most Kay Norris talk about green beans that she's been passed down in her family. I can't remember what they're called, but some that she was uh, um, handling that she was talking about in an episode one time, some green beans that were passed down. I remember M.I. Gardner uh, did a little YouTube series on he bought this pack of tomato seeds that were basically extinct. Like they, these things were like an heirloom, heirloom tomato that didn't exist anymore. I and he was, and they were like decades old. I don't even remember how old the packet was, but it was like, and now he's, he's trying to, he brought some, back. he got a couple plants survived. There was a couple seeds that, that made it when he planted them. He, he just continued to grow. And now I think you can buy those seeds on yeah, his uh, website. Cool. It's amazing. Yeah. It's pretty cool to bring something they, back like, like I that. I think it was this week I saw in the news, like this guy found these seeds in a, some cave somewhere and i just think that's so cool that are yeah. that are really old and i mean i think that's how we discovered some of the new grains like icorn and spell was like it was yeah based yeah. somewhere and yeah it kind of reminds cool. me it, it makes me think about how people do that with sourdough starters too they'll like pass them down through generations or they'll right. find one i've actually read articles where someone found a sourdough starter in a jar and some abandoned thing and they brought it back to life and it was like in italy or something and wow. made this really awesome bread out of it. It's pretty That's cool. Like, I mean, you hear stories well, like generations that. Generations from now, my sourdough starter will be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has to just happen to be in the right place, I guess. <laughs> Dry That's out. Cool. But yeah, I, this. My aunt asked me to mail her bread today. So <laughs> <laughs> wonder how that'll work out. I don't know. I'm gonna wait till it's a little cooler outside. It might not. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of things, reasons for saving seeds. I love the sense of community around seed saving. I mean, you get these yeah. communities that get together and actually have seed swaps. It's pretty we cool. You know, that we do that with the other group that I am part yeah. of. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it's fact, a somebody in the homestead front porch wanted to, and I need to get back to them because I said I have some heirloom corn. Yeah, I'm never a good person to head something like that up because I have just too much stuff on my plate. But I definitely right, yeah. do some seed swapping if somebody organized something like that. I think it's, yeah, fun. it's fun. I went to the Homesteaders of Indiana uh, thing last year, and they were a table, and I took some seeds uh, and put them on this table. And there was a table full of just seeds everybody was bringing. And it was like leave some, take some, you know, just whatever you That's want. And cool. I got some, I got some loofah seeds and. I don't know, a couple other things I thought was pretty cool. I so. love growing loofah. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, they had glass corn. Um, they had a bunch of stuff oh, that I wasn't I growing. 
I that I thought was pretty cool. See, I'm like, yeah. that's where they catch me. They send me the pretty catalog and I spend lots of money. <laughs> oh yeah. Those catalogs will get you every time. Yeah. That's, right. well, that's like one of my winter pastimes. Yeah. I mean, and people do it with plants too, not just seeds. <clears throat> yes, then, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I've actually asked my family if there was any out there, I want some of them. I would like a cutting or a seed. If anybody has any of, you know, it's kind of like the family recipes. Yeah. I'm such a seed brain one year. Like my daughter, uh, one of my daughters actually bought me seeds for Christmas for a Christmas present. Got me like this big old seed pack thing. I had all like a hundred different varieties of seeds in it. And, and I was like, that's like the perfect gift for me. Thank you. <laughs> that or books, I, either one, I'll take either one. Exactly. <laughs> seeds and books. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of great reasons to save seeds. And I just love that anytime I can close a loop on my property, I love to do it. If I can grow something, collect the seeds from it, close that loop, it, animal I can raise that I can, you know, it can reproduce on my property and, you know, close that loop. I just love to have closed loop right. systems. Yeah on my property. I think it's a good thing. And, and seed saving can do that for sure. And it's, it's just a, it's something worth doing. There are some challenges to seed saving. Like you said, there's some that are more difficult than others. You know, there's some that are super easy. Um, there's the challenges of cross pollination, which we mentioned with the corn um, and, and cucumbers, believe it or not, are actually really prone to that as well. Nice. Um, there's, there's a lot of plants that, that are prone to, to cross pollination that you have to be careful. I mean, if you truly want it to be, super super Pure careful things, about it or yeah. yeah you have to you almost have to like hand pollinate and then put these little baggies over the flowers yeah. and all kinds of stuff i mean I you can go bought those for my corn yeah you can go through some pretty big extremes <laughs> yeah. to, to try to keep yep. it pure and if you know if i was next to a corn field it's actually easier in some ways for somebody like me or you that's in town that isn't next to a bunch yes. of other gardens or fields yes. Um, like we don't have to worry about GMO cross pollination corn coming in hitting our corn. I don't anyway. Right. I'm pretty far from the either. closest cornfield, and uh, where somebody growing a garden right next to that would definitely have to be concerned with that. Um, so I mean, there's just it's one of the challenges cross pollination for some plants. Um, we mentioned hybrids and, and GMO and 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 uh, also heirloom. Those are three types of plants. And if you like, I said, if you save the seeds from a hybrid plant then um, you're not going to get a true to type. It's going to be right. something different than what you planted. It, Your it, green it, pepper could be purplish. Now. It might be good, but it ain't going to be what you planted. You don't exactly. think you're going to get the same thing. A lot of tomatoes, that's a big problem with tomatoes. A lot of people save seeds from tomatoes. And there's, a, I mean, a majority of tomatoes out there are hybrid tomatoes. And they've done that for good reasons. It's blight resistance and, exactly. you know, stuff yeah. that grows bigger, you know, things like that. But, um, yeah, you just have to be aware of what you have and be prepared. You know, if you're going to save seeds from it, just be prepared to get something different. Um, I saved seeds from a hybrid one time and the, it wasn't a cherry tomato plant, uh, a tomato, but yet it produced like a large cherry tomato. Interesting. And But it wasn't a cherry tomato plant, yeah. which is weird. Yeah, it was, it was a hybrid, something else. So, I mean, it can really be different, you know, depending on what you what you have there. Um, yeah, I mean, I use I've used <clears throat> hybrids before. I used them out here for several years. I had issues with tomato blight. So I bought tomato resistant or blight resistant Resistance. tomatoes that were hybrid for a few years while my soil just kind of recovered and I did some things. And then, um, and now I grow mostly heirlooms. Yeah. And, and heirlooms are great. And, and you know what, like I, you were talking about earlier, if you collect seeds and grow and for enough years with an heirloom variety, you'll get the stuff that's most adapted to your area yeah. for several years. Um, like I said, you can just take the ones that did the best in your yeah. environment, pull the seeds from those. And then next year do the same thing, a couple of years of that. And you're going to have those stuff that's most adapted to your, to your climate and to your, your soil and everything else. So that's a good way to do it for sure. Exactly. And, and sharing seeds with people in your area, make right. sure that that seed, that string continues. So if you do have disease one year, you can say, Hey, can I have, some of those seeds back yeah. in the tomato you grew this year because mine didn't do so well. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's some benefits to that too. Yeah. You also mentioned one of the other challenges with um with saving seeds, and that's you got your annuals, your bi biennials, and your perennials. And so with biennials, generally you only produce seed every other year. Or it has to go two years, not every other year. It's like they their whole life cycle ends at two year two, which is the seed right. cycle. Yeah. So um your biennial is a two year plant and it usually doesn't put usually doesn't put seeds usually. off to the end yeah. of that. It's the 
the weather's a certain way, the droughts a certain way. If things will force it into a survival mode, sometimes they'll produce seed earlier. Like we were talking about, I uh, had some onions that produce seed first year. Right. Onions are actually uh, biennial. A biennial, yeah. I had but some onions go to seed this year too, and they because of the drought year. and yeah, yeah, the heat, it actually made them go to seed this year. So. Um, that can happen. And so you have those challenges of waiting, right. leaving some the stuff in the ground. With us both being suburban or <clears throat> urban is we have a hard time with this. For me, I have a hard time with space, leaving that space for a biannual. Yeah. To. You know, yeah. Let it go through its life cycle. Right. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that challenge and some of them are just more difficult to get seeds from. Um, some plants have, uh, what we call they're like a wet uh, seed collection, like a cucumber and a tomato, both uh, really the best way to, uh, to do that is do fermentation and, and kind of do that. You don't have to, but it actually give you a better germin rate, germination rate. We'll talk about that. So some, some seeds are just harder to collect. Um, some, the, the, where the seeds are, or how they go. Some, I think some brassicas are like that. They're a little, they take a lot more time. They take their little hurt, like cauliflower, for example. I don't know. It just takes a while, you know, for it to, to seed. And, I have and, one I'm trying to get to seed. Now. Yeah. They look really they bad while they're going to seed. They turn almost black yeah. with all the, yeah, yeah it's yeah. weird. I don't know if it's going to do it or not. But. Yeah. It's one I've actually never took it all the way because it's like, I'm, I'm, I start cleaning up the garden before it gets there. And I'm like, okay, I just want to get it out of here. It looks so horrible. Yeah. It's <laughs> where it's dying. Right now. I should take a picture of it. It's got like little arms that are like. Yeah. Yeah. There, it's, yeah, it's a horrible looking plant when it starts going to seed. It's like the worst. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's some definite challenges, but it, it's fun, you know, and some, some things are super, super easy. Like, you know, lettuce, I think is super easy. I think peppers easy. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mel, I think uh, like your uh, squash and stuff is super easy. I mean, there's so many things that are really easy to collect seeds from, yeah, um, they are. They are. but some things are so definitely more difficult. Squash, so many seeds. Yeah. And then we talk about some different, like how to save seeds. We're, of course, we can't just in a podcast, we can't go over every oh, yeah, seed that you can collect and how you do it. But I do have some recommendations for that um, as far as learning and, and coming up with the ways to do that. If you want to chat, if you want to learn how to collect, I think even if you don't do it, it's good to know how to collect seeds from every right. plant you're growing that you like, because it, just for preparedness, if nothing else, if you could not get those seeds. You know how to get those seeds. You know, I think it's important to know how, or at least have the resources available right. to show you how. So getting some of those resources, I think is a good, well, even a good if idea. You could get the seeds, but financially you're struggling. I mean, there you we go. All yeah. Have our own once in a while, we all end up in a financial crisis. And yeah, who knows? I mean, or the country just shut down mm -hmm. again and things are just not available or you, you don't know, you just don't know what kind of situation you're going to be in. And hopefully no, no situation like that, but it never hurts to know how and, and be able to, if you need to. So I, even the plants, I don't bother to save seeds from, I know how, I mean, I, I kind of know how to save them if I have to, and I have books yep. and, and, I and other means to, to find out book, a book on my want list as well that I put in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, speaking of books, I have one right here. I have yeah, this one I right here. I like one. you have yeah. this one, seed to seed by yeah. Suzanne Ashworth. That's a good book. I like it's that one. It, I wish it had more pictures in it. Yes. That would That's be it's one. a lot of text in it. It has some good pictures in it, but it doesn't, it's not as full of pictures as I thought it would be. Uh, you think on a seed saving book, it would have pictures for everything right. it's talking about, but it doesn't. And, but you still learn how to do everything or get out seeds from all of them with that book. It just doesn't, you just got to be able to comprehend the text and make it work <laughs> instead of having a picture show you yeah. how. Yeah. I think that, um, I don't know if there's a lot of other books out there on it. It might be an opportunity for someone. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. I've seen a few. That's the, actually yeah. the only one I have as far as book for for uh, seed saving. Uh, yeah, that's all about seed saving, but it's a good one. Um, yeah, I just use um, a website. Too. Yeah, I there's one website I know of, and it, but actually that website that I use a lot too also doesn't have a lot of pictures, <laughs> which is weird. I I just you know, but there's YouTube, but anything you'd want to right. really learn how you can search a YouTube specifically on that, and probably right. find a YouTube video on it. So, well, uh, and there's some there's you know there's organizations and stuff uh, directly. What was it? What am I trying to seed, say? Seed Savers Exchange is yeah, a really like good one. Organization that is their whole focus is yeah. to do that. And so, yeah. I mean, if you are really excited about something like that, you can join them and mm -hmm. 
man. Yeah. I, the Seed Savers Exchange actually has a nice little uh, section in their website for it, it, it has uh, all the individual plants. Again, that's the one I was actually talking about. Not mm-hmm. all of them have pictures, but there is an explanation on how to get the seeds from every from about every plant you're decent, growing. They also have a decent book on saving seeds. Yeah, I don't have yeah. their book, but yeah, I don't either. That's on my Christmas wish list. Oh, Many of okay. my kids are listening. <laughs> <laughs> if they're like mine, don't count on it. <laughs> Uh, so let's just briefly talk about a few of the, maybe the common plants that we save seeds from. And I kind of lump some of them together because they're kind of the same way. I actually put tomatoes and cucumbers together because they're both what you would consider a wet, sa- a wet seed saving. I do anyway. You can not do it. Well, melons too. Right? Melons don't have a seed inhibitor or the, the sprout inhibitor, I don't think, do they? I don't think so. But then cucumbers can be part they, of the family. Yeah, but they have that. Uh, theirs is more of a gel, like a tomato, yeah. and I think they kind of fall into that category. Yeah, that that jelly stuff. That gel is an actual sprouting inhibitor uh, that comes off best by fermenting the seeds in some water. Um, so when I collect when I collect tomato, now I haven't always done it. I mean, sometimes you, you don't have to. You just will get a better germination rate if you do this. And we I soak them for three days in in water and a little bit of water. And, and I'll just stir it like once or twice a day, give it a spin. And it does a couple of things. It also, it'll ferment after about three days and then you can get those seeds out and it gets rid of all that gel that's on there. Yeah. Um, but it also separates the good seeds from the bad seeds. Your bad seeds, the ones that are less likely to germinate will float and yeah. the good seeds will sink. So I, you know, you can, if you got a bunch of seeds, you can top them in here and you'll see a, quite a few of them float to the top and they're cause they're hollow basically is why they're yeah. doing that. Yeah. It's really and, helpful to have something like that. And you'll get a better germination rate. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I do cucumber seeds. I save them. I drop them in a little bit of water and you know, maybe half a cup of water and or jar and, um, uh, stir them a couple times a day. And three days later, they'll start getting a little bit of a fermentation smell to them. And you just dump out the seeds off the top and dump them through a, a strainer and um, collect them. And then you set them out and let them dry for a few days and make sure they're really dry before you put them in their packets. Yeah, that's how I do my I do my tomatoes like that. But I've never done cucumbers. So I yeah. have a massive cucumber out there, but I'm, I'm concerned maybe it crossed because I did have I had several different varieties. of cucumbers. Yeah. They can, they for sure can. And that's one you got to be careful of. Yeah. Mine was kind of back in a corner by itself. So I didn't, and the cucumbers didn't, they looked pretty normal. So I think that they're, they're fine. Um, I, I put melon squash and peppers in the same category because I've always just kind of pulled those seeds out and just saved them. I mean, I just pull them out. I might rinse them off and I dry them. I let them dry. And then I put them in tons of those. I mean, just, yeah. Those all collect the same way. Uh, so they're pretty easy. I mean, anybody's ever ate watermelon or squash or anything. I mean, the seeds are just there. It's super, right, super. Right. Pumpkins, yep. any of that. It's just like collecting pumpkin seeds. You just pull them out, dry them off. You can rinse them off and then dry them off. I always do. I always rinse them off and dry them off. off yeah. So, and then we dry them and <clears throat> I've been just tossing them out at the property. <laughs> yeah. Well, toss them out there. a few years ago, I was raising rabbits in a colony in a fence back here by my, by my garage. And I just fenced in an area and I just had a ton of rabbits in there. It ended up being a, too many rabbits in there. I started out with just a few and it ended up with a bunch. And part of the problem with, you know, raising rabbits in a colony is you get a lot of rabbits, too many to handle. And, um, I, one year I just took, um, uh, all of our Halloween pumpkins, you know, we had pumpkins all over the place for decorations and stuff. And I just tossed them in there and the rabbits were kind of munching on them and stuff. You know, they were they were over anyway. This had like a chicken wire top on it. This K, this pin did right that I made, uh-huh. and the next year, uh, <laughs> the the all these vines started coming up the fence all the way around, and I went out there and there was just all the way across the top. It was completely covered in the vines, and the pumpkins were just hanging from the oh, top, cool. and it just looked like one of them. It just it was what it was. It was really cool. Really it was like cool. a tunnel of pumpkins, and I was just walking under, uh, and and I never planted a one of them. The rabbits planted those seeds, so of that's course, how easy yeah. it, it is to collect seeds yep. from pumpkins and yes. or squash or or melons or anything. They grow that easy and then spread that easy. So um, yeah, it was pretty neat. Um, but pepper, same way. I just, they're real easy to collect. They're smaller, but they still collect the same way. They're not real liquidy or anything like that. They just fall out, rinse them off, yeah. dry them, and you have good pepper seeds. Uh, so it's an easy one. I also put in here onions. I collect onion seeds. 
Have you ever collected onion seeds? I have done onions. Yeah. yeah. Um, turns out they're not a very long lasting seed as far as stays good for very long. I actually didn't know that because I, I had some that were pretty old and they wouldn't germinate. That makes sense why I struggled with some germination. Yeah. They're really only good for just a few months. So it's like a year by year thing you pretty much oh, have, wow. to, which is weird because they're a biennial plant normally. So yet, basically what you, what I so saved now is what I should plant. Yes. Yeah. They're usually yeah. only good for a few okay. months, unless they've been in a freezer that can prolong in a freezer right. situation, okay. which we'll talk about that in a little bit too, as far as saving them. Uh, <laughs> but onions, we learned last week that garlic is pretty much the same way. It saves pretty much the same way as, uh, as onions. So those kind of flowers that put off seeds, you know, those are flowers are in yeah. the flower. So there's a little bit different type of plant that will do a little bit different. Um, and then I bunched a few together that are surprisingly the same even though they're pretty different on the types of plants they are lettuce arugula spinach turnips radish beets i've never saved seeds from this is the first year that i've tried to save it from lettuce i have every one of those things out there right now in seed and they all have those little pods and they all some of them are a little bit bigger some of them are a little smaller but they all look about the same so do you just let the whole pod dry before you break it open i let it be pretty brown and they'll start getting a little white fluffies out the end of it as soon as it gets those little white feather looking things sticking out the end of it that's when the seeds are about ready to start flying away right okay, then you just the big pop that open and just kind of let the seeds out i usually honestly if you lay down like a bed sheet or something this is a really cool i mean i've had my kids oh, help me do this work. and just lay down a bed sheet and just start popping them all over this bed sheet and then you get another person and grab some corners on a windy day and you can just kind of toss the sheet and it'll blow the the, the chaff away from yeah, the seeds just like when you're yeah just like the wheat in the chaff. Yeah, yeah. But you could do it in baskets or whatever and just kind of blow it up on throw it up in a windy day or throw it up in front of a fan or something. And it'll it'll blow that little those little feathers and the chaff of take all that away. So yeah, and then you'll have your seeds. But I kind of do all those the same way. And they're fun to collect seeds off of, actually. And they're super easy. Look horrible though when they're growing to seed. Every, everything looks bad when it's going to yes, seed. It's like are. it just goes crazy. And I got just, beans right now that oh, yeah. look horrible. Yeah. Well, speaking of beans, that was my next thing on here. Beans yeah. and peas. They're, I would say that those two are the ones I've saved just tons. And tons super of easy. You just yeah. do you now you just let them dry on the plant? Yep. Yep. Just let yep. them go brown and then basically planted, crunch off the pod, um, huh? I've also planted dry beans purposely and you do mm -hmm. it the same way. You just let them dry on the Yeah. Yeah, so it's a those are really easy to save from. You just basically said crunch the pod off after it's good and dry. And then what you got left is a seed. It's a bean, but it's a seed. <laughs> We're eating yeah. the seeds. So yeah. peas and easy. beans. And those both. don't cross very easy. You're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Are, I think they have. Yeah. So. I think the what you mostly have to worry about are the tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, squash, peppers. I think peppers can even corn. cross yeah. corn, corn, uh, anything that's uh, pollinated by wind, any grass thing in the grass yeah. the uh, thing is, is probably. Bad. Yeah. Definitely got some, some cross pollination going there, um, so I don't I don't over worry about that because I'm not selling seeds, right, you know. Exactly. And if I get something that's a little bit cross or if it didn't come out right, it's my loss only. I don't worry about. It. If I was selling seeds, you got to be super super exactly. careful about that. You got to go through all the yep. precautions, tying the bags on, doing all the things, you know, and be really careful about that. So, um, but hand pollination um, is something you can do to help prevent a lot of that. If you're if you hand pollinate it before anything else gets to it and get it pollinated you can step in and yeah. be that replacement I've, I've actually placed grow covers over a single plant for a mm -hmm. whole summer like i did it with um i did it with a zucchini plant that i yeah. wanted to save seeds from mm -hmm. and then i pollinated that plant because the bees couldn't get into it to help it so right yeah yeah. So any insects can pollinate wind pollination. I mean, there's a lot of different pollination methods for different plants, but yeah, you can, you can be that on all of it for sure. Just got to do it. A lot of work. It's a lot of work <laughs> and it's easier for somebody like now, if you live out and you, know, you got really large acreage of, of plants you're growing, like oh. you and, and the thing is, well, I like to hand pollinate corn is because you get a better pollination rate yeah. in small batches because call, corn is when pollinated. So when you get these big fields that actually pollinates better when you grow it in small batches, it may not pollinate. Uh, you might get a lot of corn that doesn't pollinate. That's why you don't get in those ears that don't maybe yeah, just have a few kernels on them. Yeah, you, miss yeah. The you have the missing kernels. Yeah, so it's it's actually way better to hand pollinate your corn if you have small batches of corn. Like if I'm growing like a couple raised beds of corn. Yeah, and that's what I, when I do it too, I only have like, you know, yeah, I have like 
they're not even raised beds, but I mean, they're two, four by eight beds. So they're small areas. You're not going to get good wind pollination on something like that. So you really need to step in and pollinate it yourself um, when you're doing that. So, uh, you know, some of the stuff you can just like blow the pollen on, or you you might have to use Q-tip to put it on some things and and actually be that bug, you know, be the insect. Um, So, yeah, I mean, there's just different ways to ensure that, but that's, those are your main plants that I think are pretty common and there's plants in those same varieties that will, or same species that will be similar. Um, but it's really not difficult except for just a few plants are a little bit difficult. You know, the, most of them are pretty straightforward. I mean, and once you do it once, it's pretty easy. Yeah. And those are the ones that I think most people grow is your. Yeah. Yeah. It, if you save the seeds just from those right there and you, and and that's mostly what you grew. You could you could save a couple hundred dollars a year real easy <laughs> if you had a fairly decent sized garden, um, just saving oh, those yeah. seeds. And sure. so I suppose we should talk about storing seeds because that is an issue. Because I've got a bad habit of hanging on to seeds that probably aren't no good because I just collect way too many and then I don't plant them all and then I think oh I'll use these next year and then I don't and then yeah, yeah I got. I probably got seeds. I got a box in this little closet behind me of seeds. It's probably, there's probably some seeds that are over five or six years old. Oh yeah. I have They're probably no good. Yeah, you know, I have some of those too. <laughs> I tried to plant a bunch this year because I'm like, I yeah. need to get planted. I might yeah. just plant them. The Even best thing you can do is plant your yeah. If, if the best thing you can do is collect them one year, plant them the next year. I mean, it's, it's the surest best way to get good germination on your seeds. Um, but some seeds will last quite a bit longer. Um, how do you generally, like when you do seed save, how do you, how, what do you put your seeds in? Well, I make, <coughs> excuse me. I make sure they're super dry, super dry. Yeah. <clears throat> and then this year, typically what I have saved was um, old medicine bottles or vitamin mm-hmm. bottles. And they very frugal of you. <laughs> yes. It's, <laughs> and, and they have the little desiccant in them. Yeah. And I can, you can re-dry those in the bottom of your dehydrator yep. and then yeah. I will put it in there with the seed. And if you have to buy those, those are pretty inexpensive yeah, too. I you can buy, I buy, the show, I put the link in the show notes. I think I put one in there too for them. <laughs> <Did> <laughs> like, <you>? yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's like 250. I, I mean, I, I'll i buy like so 250 cheap. at a time for just a few dollars and yeah, and yeah. you can use them over and over and over. Like you said, you can re-dry um, dry them out and yep. yeah. Or they come in, if they come in vitamin bottles, sometimes um, yeah. you just want to make sure they're food safe. That's all. Yep. There are food grade ones yes you're yeah. absolutely right yeah so i will do that but those have not proven believe it or not to be that great because they're not sealed really well like air still gets in there so this year i bought um some little tiny mylar bags okay yeah that i can actually zip like these i can squeeze mm-hmm. the air out and put the little uh, moisture absorber in with them. And I'm going to try that method because mm-hmm. I have last year, I had a whole bunch of pumpkin seeds mold. Yes. I've had some seeds mold so, too. Yeah. And um, I think it's our, we had really humid year this year and this spring. And I think because that vitamin bottle wasn't like sealed, they just closed. But okay. Sealed. I think yeah. You want a good sealing and yeah, yep. moisture is definitely the enemy of your seed moisture, yeah. light, you know, those yep. things are so bad I for your moisture seeds. is getting in Heat. those because they're not airtight. Yeah. No. So, yep. So I'm changing up my method. I'm getting rid of my frugal method and I'm going to the, but I can reuse the Mylar bags. Yeah. yeah. I, I just will. Them because they're not, no light will get in there. That's why I bought those. For me, I, I not quite as fancy as you as far as the bags. I use these little, really cheap little paper envelopes the, the oh, that are yeah. basically the four seeds are just like the little brown yeah. seed envelopes yeah. and i use those they are super super cheap get hundreds of them real cheap and uh, now i save some seeds in those like smaller seeds like you know like my beet seeds or whatever <laughs> yeah now beans corn uh you know just any of the bigger seeds i usually use like a, a half pint or a pint jar actual mason jar with an yeah, airtight yeah. lid i'll throw one of them little gel packs in there that's for moisture and um and that's all i do i mean that's and like you said make sure they're super super dry but bigger seeds go in jars, smaller seeds go in a, and those uh, yeah, I paper have, seed packets. Um, some of my corn seeds, I actually have in one, and I took my, I have a food sealer. So I took the jar and vacuum sealed out. the Vacuum sealing is a good way. Even 
Yeah. I mean, it, vacuum sealing would be a good way to, to really do your seeds. Uh, I would put it, I would still put a moisture pack in there probably just in case there's yeah, any moisture in those seeds yeah. at all. They yeah. Dried out for a you while. can pull them out. Yeah. Sure. Um, for sure. That's moisture a good way to do it. Definitely the enemy. It's like, think of it as like when you're storing your flour or sugar, mm-hmm. moisture is the enemy. <laughs> but I will also say this, this is a, something that I have messed up on bad in the past is not properly labeling my seeds. Oh. I have, here. I have, uh, shuffled through my little seed collection thinking I would know what those seeds were. And I'm like, I have no idea what those are. And then I plant some in tea tray and I'm watching them grow. And I'm like, I still don't know what those are. <laughs> I had that happen to me last year. So yeah. I grew tobacco because tobacco is a beautiful, beautiful plant. And it's good pest resistant. It's plant. very good pest resistant. Yeah. It's good for worming. So I grew it. I'm just in your picture. You chowing on a big water, a big water backer. Uh, yep, yep. You caught me. And um, oh, and they also will. They're uh, they will catch the tomato worms and eat that, and they prefer that over. No, tomatoes. really. Now that I yeah. didn't know. Yeah. 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 Anyways, they're and they're absolutely beautiful. Well, anyways, I saved seeds for those, and I saved seeds for poppies, but I didn't label them, thinking the same thing. Oh, I'm gonna know what those are, and they're both mm-hmm. just. Uber, they are the tiniest seed, grain of sand. They are yeah. just so tiny, but I'm like, I don't know which was which. So I did the same thing. I planted a bunch of them and I had to wait till they came up. They look very different once they come up. Okay. Yeah. Some don't, but, some plants don't look so different when they first start coming up. Then I could label it, but I was like, I yeah. will not do this again. But every, every time I do that, I say, I will not do this again. Yep. Label your packets, label your jars, go above and beyond on that. Cause yes. And make the, sure like it you won't remember fall off. I've had it where it yeah. like, faded. Yep. Or, yep. Yeah. If I'm doing a jar, I'll just take a permanent marker and write it right on top of the lid or something. Yeah. Or, wash that off. Yeah. yeah I, I, I just, you know, I go all out on it in those paper packets. Your friends. Make, make sure, make sure that you're labeling it really good. Cause it, it's just, it's so funny how you think. And I do the same thing in my garden. I plant a garden thinking I know where I put everything. And I don't put markers in there. And then it's like, what did I plant there? I don't even know what that is. And I have to wait till it starts almost fruiting sometimes before I, I know what it is. One of my peppers right now. Yeah. I have no idea what it yeah. is. Yeah. It's crazy. What pepper is and, that? I, and yeah, you just think you're going to remember for some reason. And you just can't. Well, I I, did, so I did actually put stakes in, but I they they um either rotted or faded yeah some of them fade really bad i thought about making me some some of those painted ones uh the really nice like get like a one by two or something and paint them and then well you know what i've actually got a laser engraver now i could actually laser engrave some i thought about wood burning yeah well that's what that laser engraver does it later you know i could actually do some really nice uh i would do that give me some good wood i also have a couple of friends who's sons mess around with like um what do you call them the 3d printers mm-hmm. have them make thought, you oh, i could you know give their little side gigs yeah because we're talking about permanent marker stuff but in the sunlight and in water those things will fade after a while uh, they, they get to where well, you can't see either. them yeah these were the big popsicle sticks mm-hmm. like yeah the ones the doctors used to use yep. the bigger ones with permanent marker on them and faded. and i had a solution to that glass i was actually taking a wood burner and burning them at one point and burning the word in there, but then they rot, they get out there in the water and they rot and then they just disappear. And then it's like, okay. Um, Cause they're not made to last of course in the weather. So they, right. they'll just rot away. So yeah, you're better off with something a little heavier duty. Um, I don't know. Yeah, coming up so with something. That's my idea. This, maybe this, you know, I have all these grand ideas for winter. <laughs> it is a good time to do things like that for sure. So you put them in your jars, you put them in their mylar bags. I put mine in my little seed packets. Uh, where do you put them? Well, <laughs> I should probably put them in a refrigerator, but I don't have space. So I keep mine in my basement, which is fairly cool. And dry. Yeah, Cause some driver, dry. some basements yep. are prone to moisture. So know your basement, you know, have yep. a dehumidifier down there yep. or something, but um, yeah, any place cool, dry, dark. Most of the time, I know the refrigerator or the freezer would be better as long as they're fully dry. My, I have heard stories about um, bean seeds specifically not being dry. And them actually cracking in the refrigerator. In the yes. Freezer. freezer. Yeah. 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 Even in the refrigerator, you want them very dry because it can damage yeah. the seeds if they're not completely dry. Yeah. It's very important to make sure they're very, very good and dry. If you're going to put them in there, your refrigerator or the freezer. Um, I store most of my seeds in. See that closet behind me? 
yeah. <laughs> there's boxes of seeds well, that's my back problem. there. <laughs> I would need a whole refrigerator almost for my seeds. Yeah. And I know, I actually know a guy who does that. He has a refrigerator in his garage yeah. that is a seed refrigerator. Is there a group for seedaholics? Cause I might belong. <laughs> yeah, I probably do too. I've got a lot of seeds. I'm all the time grabbing yeah. seeds for yeah, anything. So if I, I would seriously need almost the entire. It, yeah, if you're thinking long-term storage, very dry seeds in the right. freezer will definitely preserve them. The colder, the better right. seeds stay better, stay good. So one uh, of the things, if we're going to go talk about, um, you know, self-sufficiency or preparedness, this was something my mentor talked about doing, which is a great idea. He actually suggested, he has a very large seed collection. He said, just taking a few of those seeds and putting them in the freezer or the refrigerator instead of like your whole box, Mm -hmm. taking like five of your pea seeds, just so you have some. Well, and I think knowing your seeds too. For me, it's like knowing what seeds are prone to last longer than others. uh, And then just sticking the ones in there that, like we talked about onions, so those things don't last, but months, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a short, they're, they're a year. I mean, is what they are. They're like a year uh, seed. Like here's some, here's a few seeds that are short term, like parsley, onions, parsnip, believe it or not, lettuce and, and um, tomatoes are the longest tomato seeds and brassica seeds can last the longest. So really, really not necessary to uh, put those in a freezer uh, tomatoes. Um, normally can live up to about 18 years to get good German eight year, eight years for a good germination rate and brassicas are seven years. So quite a while on those two and things. Did you, where did you get that line, that info? Uh, this is a blog post I put together a while back on my site, but I, I, mean, I, I did the research or I did the research back then when I put it together and, and looked at it, but I'm just scrolling I through it. Egg, links to that. I'm going to have to read that. Eggplant four years, cauliflower, four years, carrot seeds, three pumpkin seeds, four, um, some of these are sweet corn, two years, peppers, two years, spinach, three years, watermelons, four Zen years. Corn? I don't know. I don't have that in here. It's, kind of, it's a small list I have in here, but yeah, I mean, corn probably is all pretty close. I bet. That's what um, I'm thinking. yeah, but just some, just to give people an idea of the different kinds of space you're right. looking at. I mean, some seeds are definitely more prone to last without being having extra care than others you could probably you could prolong any of these things by putting them in a freezer um and so your shorter ones you might want to do that with with lettuce with me it's like i don't need it yeah it's a one-year seed but i mean i'm planting like tons of it a matter of fact i i collect seeds in the spring that i plant this time of the year for my lettuce you know i'm not even waiting a year (laughs) waiting just a few months to plant it replant it so i go through a ton of lettuce seed Um, I have my Swiss chard right now. It's taking forever to finish the process of going to seed. And it looks just horrible. Swiss chard is a, because it's, it's one of the plants that um, lives through the uh, winter really well. So it won't, um, is Swiss chard a biennial? I'm thinking it is. I think it is. I think it is too. I remember right. Cause I think I've had it two years in my garden before. So okay. it's going to look ugly for a while. <laughs> As I was like, cause I, I pick it in the winter and eat it. I mean, I, I shake the snow off of it sometimes just, and bring it in the house. Love, I don't know why we love it so much, but we just love it. So yeah. I don't love the stalks. I wish I could find something I like to do with the stalks. Cause they're so stringy and tough. And I mean, I've heard people do like pickling them and things. I, I don't, I've never found, been able to pick them if you pick them when they're small right? yeah when they're small they're fine but once they get big i mean i don't know what big, you can do with them it. yeah I they're just it out. yeah they're so even the veins in it are really tough the rabbits like them yeah well yeah they'll nibble on but but they'll eat tree limbs so they aren't too picky <laughs> it's kind of the same thing <laughs> at that point yeah um, you could ferment them they're great for the compost i don't know yeah they were good in compost there you go uh but yeah there's just some ideas on on as far as like some seeds and what you'd have to you know, storage times and whatnot. But again, the colder the, they are, the longer they'll last generally. Um, but it's not necessary. If you got a, a, a reasonably cool place, dark place, dry place, they'll do what they need to do. You can, and you're using them at, in a re, at a reasonable pace. And you're not just, these people who buy these, Bucket. these oh, bucket yeah. seeds of preparedness seeds and put them in a you know stick them in their basement for 20 years those aren't gonna grow most of those aren't gonna grow yeah. and, you and might get some but and i think it's really a good idea to start growing and start learning i mean doing it is the best way to 
develop the skill. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, we mentioned a few resources, uh, seed savers exchange. I'll have a link in the show notes for them. This book seed to seeds are really is it, it's a good book. I wouldn't say it's great. It's good. It'll give you a, a good idea. It's a good resource to have. Um, just to have in case you want to know how something you didn't have access to the internet or whatever, and you want to know how to save the seeds and something, it will tell you how that plant produces a seed and how to collect it. Um, you can get those food grade moisture absor- or absorbers. Those are really good to have. The seed yeah. envelopes are really good to have. All real cheap moisture stuff. Absorbers are great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And for a lot of things. I mean, even when you're doing dehydrated foods, I use them. Anything yeah. I dehydrate, like we would dehydrate like chili peppers and stuff, and I throw one of them in the jar and um, just any. Yep. Anything I'm dehydrating like that, any powders I make or anything like that, I throw one of those in there. Those are just good to have on hand. Uh, oh, I see the book you put in there, Seed Garden, The Art and Practice of yeah, Seed Saving. That's okay. From, that's from Seed Savers Exchange. It's okay. That, good. I've actually leafed through that one. Illustrated. Yeah. I'd like to see I that one. I don't own it, but I've read some. I've well, I got one to put on my yeah. list too now. So <laughs> good <Yeah>. deal. <laughs> um, and I put a link to that blog post that has a few of those uh, uh Length right. of times well, to your, save your seed envelopes. Yep, because I think I like having those. I mean, they're just, and, and those are really handy too if you're doing seed exchanges with people because they're yeah. really really cheap. I do, and I have if you just want to drop a few seeds in there and, and send them off, and yeah. you know they're pennies per envelope, so you don't have, have that. We don't have a lot of money in them. Yeah, for sure. So uh, that's really all I have. To me, seed saving isn't complicated. It's it's a uh, some can be more complicated than others. I like the challenge. I like to know how to do it. I might even, even ones I don't normally see that, like we're talking about, do you save the seeds from carrots? No, but now you think, I'm thinking, but I'd like to, I think I will next time. I think I might leave some carrots in there and try to do some seed saving because I, I would like to do it. It's it's one thing to know how to do it. It's another thing to actually have done it. it is. And it because is. you, there's little nuances about things that you learn that you just can't get from a book, you know? And it's nice to actually have the hands-on experience of doing that. So even if it's something I don't always want to do, it'd be something I'd like to do once or twice to know how to do it. And if you did it systematically, so if you used the ones that last shorter and the ones that last longer Mm -hmm. in a small garden, one year you could save beans and then not save beans for a couple of years since they last longer, but leave your carrots in, those ones that are don't last as long, your carrots and your onions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, another thing with like onions, for example, you might want to alternate plantings on those that you're going to, that way every year you have some going to seed because they're a biennial. Right. And yep. so you might want to have some, you put leave this year, some you leave the next year and then have them alternate, you know, yeah. um, for your seed collection that way. Well, and, and it doesn't take a lot. You get a lot of seeds out of one onion flower. I mean, there's probably oh, a, yeah. a couple hundred seeds that come out of that one onion flower. So you, you leave a dozen or five, 10, you know, onion seeds, and you're going to have a lot of onion or t- 10 onions are in the ground. You're gonna have a lot of onion seeds. Yeah. And we have, I mean, and there are some plants too that are perennial. Mm -hmm. Perennials, you can generally collect seeds every year. Right. But the life cycle of the, of the plant is several years. Yeah. I mean, and those are harder when it comes to foods have not very many foods are perennial, but there are a few. And a lot of, a lot of perennials, Northern perennials will require, will require stratification. Yeah. um, And which means you'll have to have so many chill hours on the seed. Um, a lot of tree seeds will require that. Some plant seeds require that though, too. Like yeah. we were talking so about garlic last week. Be, chill hours would be, you can put it in your refrigerator for a specific amount of time. Yep. It has to be below a certain hours. temperature for a certain amount of hours, yep. basically is what it, yeah. it means. Cause those are trees or plants that are designed. They're made to grow up in Northern areas. And I don't have it in here, but there is a book. I think it's story put out the, these little booklets that like, 20 pages long okay. and um one of the they have one on um what we were just talking about stratification on um, stratification <laughs> okay it gives a list of the seeds that do better that way it's actually okay nice book. yeah some book. don't actually absolutely require it but you'll get it's a better like germination dollars. rate it's if you do it it's an expensive book it was like yeah. four or five dollars when i bought it i have to look into that yeah if you find the link yeah. to that send it over we'll throw that yeah, in the show notes sounds like one i might want to get myself um yeah. Yeah, and also talks about scarification, which is when the seed needs scarification. Yeah, when you rough it up a little bit. When you rough it up yep, a little bit. With yep, like a there are some, some people do that with even like hot water. Uh, you can yeah, do it yeah. that way. So yeah, there's some it's different a nice ways to do that. Book. It's like I think it was 
I'll have to look and see. I think it yeah, was- if you can find it, yeah, for sure. We'll add it into yeah. the show notes. Well, again, seed saving doesn't have to be complicated. You can start easy. You can start with the simpler stuff. Yeah. Uh, start with start with your pumpkins this year for, you know, you got your Halloween pumpkins out there this year. And you're going to clean the seeds out. Save a few of those and try to plant them. I mean, uh, your, your squash, your watermelon. Um, things like that. It's really easy. I mean, and some things are super, super easy and let a few things go to seed and try it. Beans are super easy. Peas. Yeah. Beans um, about right now are starting to. Yep. They're starting to get browned out. Uh, all those noodle beans. I told you, I didn't really care for that much. They're all uh, dried out. I could go out there and collect seeds off those. I just don't know if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> unless you want unless somebody else like well i i thought about maybe growing them next year i didn't try a lot of different ways to cook them and I, you could do some different things with them probably that would change that flavor yeah. a little bit there's just a little there's a slight flavor it had a little aftertaste flavor i didn't like all? uh i just boiled them and How made them that like way them stir fried. yeah i just boiled them and cooked them that way and ate them uh softened them up and ate them that way but yeah actually the actual beans inside i was just breaking them up like a kind of like a green bean but i almost wonder if i just take the actual beans out of them and to make those it'd be better some of them yeah yeah I, was, I might try that so i might grow them again next year i love the way they look they're cool i got a they neat little cool. um i've got the neat uh, uh tripod thing i made out there uh from the climb and um and man they just filled it up and all the noodle beans are hanging down it looks really neat so fun fact i live i mean i'm sure most people know by now if you listen regularly but if you don't i live in zone five northern michigan last year i apparently missed a couple of those pods that i let dry they planted themselves yeah the fell to the ground yeah. oh really wow i don't know if birds dropped them there but there's like six plants in my hmm. strawberries and yeah, I can't believe they lived through the freeze. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I kind of believe it. I think it probably helped them maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So maybe I should. So I let those go to seed because I'm like, those lived through winter here. Yeah, so that's something that would obviously be adapted to your climate pretty yeah, good or it, it let, could be. I'm letting those all go to That or you dropped them this spring and didn't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> that's possible. Uh. I had that. Oh. That now that you say that, I had I actually <laughs> had that happen to me one year with turnip seeds for two years in a row. I had turnips coming up in this one corner of the garden where I dropped a packet. Yeah, and I've had stuff like that happen. Just got huge. Or right, I've laid the packet down while I've been planting over in this bed, and laid it down. A bunch of it spilled out. And I didn't realize it and picked it up. And you got this big old blob of something growing over here. And it's like, how'd that get over there? And it's like, right. I bet you I put that seed packet over there. And yep. yeah, that happens. <laughs> it happens. Um, well, that's about all I have on seed saving. It can it can be as simple or as complex as you really want it to be. It can definitely be more complex. There are oh, yeah. there are when you get into the hybrids and and the things. There's so much there because there's seed saving that happens there, and you can actually create your own hybrids and you can get into a whole thing there. You can get into a, I mean, you can make it very complex. And and there's a, there's a place for that. I mean, if you're, if you're oh, wanting yeah. to take it to that level and it's something you enjoy, you can definitely do that. I'm I'm the simple kind of gardener. I like to. Think keep things as easy as possible <laughs> just for yeah. time constraints if nothing else um but uh yeah i mean it's it can be pretty easy or it can be hard right. and, and that's why i was saying if you're interested in that you can go somewhere like seed saver yes find your people because th- that's what those people yes do. they're yeah. like neck deep and that for sure for yeah. sure well did you want to tackle on some of these questions from the homestead front porch yeah, i see you put a list of them in there the um printed out doesn't have it on i know there was oops i just whacked the microphone <laughs> It happens. Um, yeah, I seen one on peach. This somebody had a, a disease issue. It looked like or a pest issue. Yeah, I could on their peach tell, trees. Yeah, I, I both. It does look very. It different. it looked disease, but then as I had done a little bit, of, I kind of did a little bit of research and looked at some pictures and stuff. And after a while, I think that she said she either thought it was a disease or it was this peach tree borer. And looking at some pictures, I found some peach like tree borer. borers that looked just like that it on the trunk. Like the disease when i looked up the disease and like, so it kind of does look like both and she, they couldn't tell either and yeah that's a tough one um it, one thing for sure is when you're dealing with a really heavy pest infestation or a really serious disease issue on a tree being people who are really into organic methods it gets hard because and they're so um, over. It's yeah, it's so much slower and it takes so much more work and you just have to be so diligent. And I found one recommendation, a recommendation was just neem oil, like a, like a strong neem oil solution and just right. keep after it. And, and that tree looks, that tree looks like it's in pretty bad shape. I don't know yeah. if she's going to save it. My, yeah, it did look really bad. My friend that was in, is in horticulture because I have an apple tree that was in pretty bad shape. 
would suggest treating it, but also, but I don't know if you would want to do that this fall, but making sure it has proper food and nutrition so that it can help itself. So it can help itself fight to it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Feeding the tree. Yeah. You talked about that on a couple episodes. I think, I think, I think yeah. um, so dirt doctor that, talks a lot about that. He yeah. pulling the soil back tree, you know, and, and really getting the tree healthy because the tree can fight for itself and, yeah, and so ward off a lot of things with the neem oil and make sure it has enough um, nutrients and yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, are both good ideas. I think you just kind of have to hit something like that on multiple fronts to really attack it in an organic way, you know? Um, but yeah, that looked pretty rough and, and I don't have a lot of other advice other than that. I, I suggested a link of, of, to an article that I found that had a few organic suggestions, but other than that, I don't know a lot of, <laughs> a lot of I don't I have a lot of answers lot of for that. Extensions now are helping with organic you, methods so they might you could might go see a county extension optimist. office yeah. yes it might be an yeah. option there too i know she had a, a good reason for wanting to save the tree and 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 i yeah it had yeah yep. so i mean you know i i can understand had, you know like we were talking about it had some family history it did and so i understand the struggle there so hopefully that she can uh do some things to try to save that another one was on fence posts uh, and using uh trees that they yeah. have on the property to make fence posts That's and there was a lot of good suggestions on that um there was, in already, I don't, do you know if locust grow because that was one of your suggestions yeah i said black uh-huh. locust but where were they at they were in um did they even say where they were uh i, I think, think no they didn't but yeah bl- black locust is i mean there's been stories of those things lasting 100 years making fence posts out of black locust trees um I look and see if those grow this far north I know they make a good one oak post oak i mean i seen post oak i seen i mean cedar here cedar is a natural bug that. deterrent kind of you know and it has some natural oils in it that will help yeah. it last a lot longer uh osage orange i didn't mention that one in there i didn't see it mentioned either but osage orange is a really hard wood and i think it makes pretty good fence posts also um i don't know if it grows where she's at but uh yeah, I've seen a few other examples. And, and then some, uh, one person mentioned something because they said using trees and making their own posts. But then I think somebody uh, understood it as even just leaving some trees in the ground and using them as posts to, to connect to. And yeah. and you can do that. But then there's this issue with like the wire getting into the tree and the tree kind of growing right. on the wire. Well, and then the but tree but one person has a suggestion of actually attaching a two by four to the tree and then attaching the wire to a two by four. That's not a bad idea. And it didn't, that way it wouldn't grow, the wire wouldn't cut and grow into the tree. So that was another um, suggestion. So there were some good suggestions. Um, well, and there's like, I mean, living fences and stuff too, but those take a while. Yeah, for sure. So there's some things you could do. I mean, I, again, I think it's great that you can use products that are already on your property. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To do those kind of things. And instead of going and buy, especially with the price of lumber these days, it's just oh, unreal. Some of it is crazy. I, yeah. we have, you know, we have a lot of fencing to do, so I'm always interested in that topic. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then where you're going to be at your 20 acres. Yeah. You're, you're going to be looking for alternative methods of putting yeah, things fenced. Yeah. Sure. So that was something definitely applied to you. And then there was another question about docu- documentary documenting your homestead journey yeah this one i thought was i thought was interesting was interesting depends on how you want to well i think they were talking about like planners and journals and things like that with a book uh i i think i think you have it too it's the thomas jefferson garden uh, book i have that and i think you have it too and and he did he documented everything his garden about everything and now we can benefit from that years and years later you know decades century later um so it's pretty cool to have a documentation of what you're doing on your property i think it's really neat and i tried to buy blank books like that and write my own thing and i end up 20 30 pages into it and then i give up or i forget to do it anymore and then it goes away what's worked good for me has been podcasting and blogging because every time I blog about something I'm doing, guess what? I'm talking, I'm keeping a record of what I'm doing if I talk about doing it on a blog. So I think right. even having a blog is a good way to do it, or a vlog on YouTube is another good well, way to do it. Ken, so here's, I actually have, this is going to sound weird, but I actually have a private Instagram account mm-hmm. that only I can see and I send pictures there in case my phone dies. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, I use Google photos and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You could even do something like that if it wasn't, you don't want it to be a public thing. Right. But I I like the idea. Something only a few people have. I think if you've got the, and I think if you've got the, the kind of, 
attitude where you can really focus and keep track and stay at it and do it. I think journaling is a great idea. I mean, I do that in certain things, but for gardening, it just never, doesn't seem to be something I can stick with, you know, it was the same thing. I think I have, I give up after a while and then I forget. Yeah. And I think it's great though, because you can keep track of when you're planting things normally and how they did when you planted this time or when you harvested and how good it did. And you yeah. can just really keep, and you can go back and look at those things. I think it's awesome to be able to do that. You're creating your own almanac. Almost. But for me, it's, it's easier for me to do it online or something and have like this public accountability kind of thing or and plus i can go back and just look and say oh yeah i remember when i i did that you know i saved these sunflower seeds this time of the year and you know how i did it and what i did and and plus i get to make something that other people can look at too which is kind of cool you know right yeah and i have this one oh what year was it where i grew the huge i had this huge sunflower i remember and i think we were both had some really tall ones that year and we were comparing them you know so it's nice to be able to have yeah. Look back. Right. And so, you know, some things have made that easy. Facebook is definitely one way to journal. I mean, you could do it through social media and go back on your own right. Facebook page and look at those things. And that's kind of fun. I guess you could do that. There's a lot of ways. I, I am a book guy. I think books are cool. If you can do it, that's a cool yeah. way to do it. If you can just keep notepads and books or whatever and do it. I think it's really, really neat. Yeah. I think probably if you were going to do it in a book, at least my opinion is it almost has to be something that you leave open sitting in a spot that you go are near yeah. often. Yeah. There you go. It's a good idea. You put that away. It's yep. out of sight. I, I actually bought me. these pretty thick hardback blank books and they're just blank pages. I mean, they don't even have lines on them because I wanted to be able to draw some things on there that, you know, I was dealing with maybe a bug or something, you know, and draw what right. a bug was tagging something. You just do, you know, a real journal type thing, you know, and I, like I said, it probably has, 250 pages in it and I got about 30 pages into it and just quit, but it was a cool idea. And I think it's, I still think it's a cool idea. I just, I'm such a busy person. It's hard for me to stay at it, you know, but I think if somebody could do that, it's pretty neat. I think it's a neat way to do it. And it'd be something, especially if you did it in hardcover, like you were talking, it'd be something that might be something that passed down to your kids kids and grandkids. Yes. I think that's, that's exactly the thought I had in mind when I started doing it. Yeah. I mean, my mom, because I would love to have something like that for my grandparents. Exactly. You know, I'd love it. I would love it. I mean, that's like, we're all, we love Thomas Jefferson's. Yeah. I love it. I mean, it's just neat yeah. to see what he was dealing with and how he was organizing right. things and growing things. And he kept and pretty good notes. Was, he yeah. He kept some pretty good notes on that stuff. But they were, I will say as much as we're saying we weren't perfect about it, they were inconsistent. I mean, when you read through it, he didn't do it every day. He yeah, was, right. You know, yeah, he had dates in there. Yeah, there. he would skip things for sure. Yeah, yeah. So he wouldn't write for three months and give up on it for two years like I did. But yeah, he'd go. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah I, I think it'd be neat. I would love to maybe have a, a few years where I could actually maintain but that. But I do think it's like, I think for me, one of my biggest downfalls there was I would put the book away. And if I. Mm-hmm. It's a good idea. Just keep it I out. Wanted to keep it. Yeah. I think keep it in some place where you're going to see it every day and you're going to think about the things I did today and then. Yeah, like on the kitchen table or at yeah. the office desk. It, it is easier in a lot of ways now to keep documentation on things. We can snap pictures in our garden. We can snap pictures of a bug or a bird or a, the plant as it's growing. And we can take these pictures. And if we can, if we just organize those things in little folders and things, yeah. I mean, you could document that way too. It'd be kind of neat. Yeah, you um, could do that. You could yeah. take pictures of stuff and like put make put it in a folder on your computer. Yeah, um, for sure. September 22. Yep. August, September, August 22. You don't get all the details maybe that way, but you could do little notes or something and attach a note right. next to it. Or I don't know there's a lot of ways you could do it, but um, some things I'm better at than others. And some things just don't work blog. for me at all. Start a blog. It's a good way. Actually. I mean, I mean, blogging started out as people just wanting to basically journal what they were doing. Yeah. I mean, that's what it yeah. turned into more of a business type thing, but in the beginning, it's all it really was. And that's what a lot of people vlog, you know, the video logs on, on YouTube. That's a lot of what they do too. They get out there and they just put their camera on their phone and they do a little video log. And, um, and that's what that is too. I mean, you could do it that way. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to do it. And you don't even have to make it public. You can unlist it on YouTube and just put it there and leave it unlisted. I have, I have an unlisted account on YouTube. As yep. Well. So you can do those kind of things. So yeah, you can, I mean, yeah. not everybody has to do it, but so. I, yeah, but I would suggest with some of those more public places that you probably have it backed up somewhere just in case. Cause get kicked off. Yeah. Yeah. You could for sure. Especially yeah. in this genre and people say things and get offended by something and just throw you out in a minute. <laughs> For right. sure. I mean, it's less likely on a private one, but still, I mean, you're not owning your content then. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, okay. I think that's pretty good. What do you have anything extra you want to throw in there? I think that is it. 
Get there and save some seeds, folks. It's pretty easy, and I think it'll be worth it for you. (laughs) Well, that's all I have. And uh, until next week, happy homesteading and God bless. 